Good to see everyone out tonight. It's been a beautiful day. You know, spring's always a fun time to recall when we've had a rough winter and sunshine and a bright. You know, in that fairer land where the sun never sets because God is as light, we will not have any clouded day and certainly will not grow old. In this life, as I say, if you live long enough, you get old, you grow older. A lot of times we don't notice how quick it is. But next thing you know, we're there. And so I'm glad to be with you tonight. Had to go to uh, Louisville this morning. And so the lesson I've selected tonight, uh, I started out looking at a word. Next thing I know, as I got off track with what I thought I was going to prepare and what I ended up preparing. And so as we consider that for the night, the word is blameless and it's meaning, you know, uh, we live in society that just a lot of, just a lot of times they won't take responsibility or blame uh, because they just don't like being blamed or responsible. They're blaming somebody else for the situation that's going on. Uh, so unfortunately, they live in a society where they even blame someone's color of their skin, whether they succeed or where they don't succeed, or that they didn't succeed because of somebody else's certain privileges. Certainly, God doesn't teach that. God is no respecter of persons, neither are we to be as his children. And so we live in a society a lot of times blame. You know, it just doesn't start when you become an adult. A lot of times it, help, it starts out when we're children, we never outgrow that. And certainly as mature as Christians, we need to outgrow that. You know, my wife, when I first met her, her, her brothers was rushing around in the front room, you know, which my, my parents would never allow. Now, they may have allowed other things, but uh, that wasn't one of them. They'd wrestle around the room, and so when Maxine would be going sometimes, they They'd have a little tossle, and next thing you know, they broke something. <laughs> of course, they immediately wanted to hide, but she knew every piece that she had right down to the T. And uh, Melinda got real good at gluing the pieces they broke. <laughs> so they brought her in on this. So uh, was she blameless? Not completely as far as hiding it, trying to cover it up. But finally, the eagle eye would see it. Sure enough, okay, who broke the glass, who broke this piece, that piece, you know. And uh, finally, they had to all own up and confess what happened. And of course, Melinda was a professional gluer by then. And so it's one of her talents, her gifts. And so sometimes the grandchildren may have something broken, they want to bring it over to her to glue. And so it is, we live in society by blame, you know. Gas prices, look how high they are, you know. They went up three times this week. It sets us in shock a little bit, sets us back. You know, they even make, you know, it is what it is. You know, one thing it's not. <laughs> you know, they want to blame Putin for that. Well, everything has an, a reaction to it. Sometimes our policies are things we do change. I, I'll tell you what, the, the one that surprised me the other day was they blamed the last administration on it. <laughs> and that really took me, I thought, wow, they're really fishing to blame them for that, but some will. Because of them, that's, you know, that's where they want to put it. So we live in society often, you know, this one's at fault, that one's at fault. And next thing you know, there's a scuffle in the room. You got to come in, you know, when I, I told people at work, you know, I used to babysit work. Uh, watch my children. They said, when I got to be older, I'd referee. <laughs> uh, because uh, if there was a dispute, you know, you'd, the thing it is, if you're not there, it's hard to referee something you didn't see. So someone's got to own up, confess up. Uh, maybe they have to share the blame. But a lot of times if they're going to get in trouble, no one wanted to just jump out there and said, it's me. And so that's still a tendency sometimes as adults. But certainly we need to consider our lives 
needs to be blameless, innocent, free from guilt, not responsible. But you know, as we consider guilt, for all men have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so therefore we all need the blood of Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter what we have or have not done. We're still sinners and we need the blood of Christ. You know, as we look at some accounts, we look at in Genesis 17 and one of Abram. This time he's Abram and not Abraham. But when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the almighty God, walk before me and be thou perfect. Other translations renders that blameless. And so, uh, uh, like I say, the King James renders it perfect, but in the italics, uh, it's got blameless for me in side note. And so it is, we look, that that was Abram's, uh, God walked before me. He says, I am the almighty God. And so God wants us to be blameless. He wants us to be perfect. We're followers of him. As we look over in Job's account, the term blameless is used again. Job 1 and 1. There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job. That man was blameless and upright, one that feared God and eschewed evil. And so as we know and understand about the life of Job, he certainly was one that we could follow an example of his manner of life. As a matter of fact, God goes on about how Job is. You know, sometimes, you know, when your children are being good, you want to, you know, say, wow, you know, it's reflection on the parents. And when they're not mishandling, you know, Melinda says, well, that's, you know, <laughs> that's your daughter or that's your son. <laughs> now, now it's the dog. It's the puppy that we got. When he's doing something bad, that's your dog, go get him. <laughs> but, uh, but anyhow, if, as we consider those things, here's God. He's, he's telling Satan. Have you looked at my servant Joe? You know, uh, how he's upright. Uh, and the Lord said in Satan in verse 8, Thou hast considered my servant Job, there's none like him in the earth, a perfect or blameless and an upright man, one that feareth God and sheweth evil. Of course, the old devil, he wanted to put this to a challenge. And so God allows him to be tested to show that Job, and God allowed him to do that, except taking of his life. Matter of fact, he allowed him to take his children's lives. He lost all his children. He lost all his possessions. He even afflicted his flesh. And yet, Job remained upright in all his affliction. It's amazing. So when you think that life gets a little tough, and my life's a little tough, look at Job. Look at our Lord, what he suffered. And so as we consider those who are blameless, we also turn to the New Testament. We find in Luke's account, there in chapter one of John the Baptist's parents, Zacharias and Elizabeth, there in chapter one, five and six, there as it mentions Zacharias and Elizabeth, in verse six, it says they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. Can God say that about you? Can God say that about me? And so as we consider our lives, uh, can we be blameless? Well, we can be, and we should be. And certainly, does that mean that we're sinless? Certainly it does not. You know, if you look over in John's account there, in John chapter 8, there we find... This woman that's caught in adultery. John 8 there, on this account, the scribes there in verse 3, brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. When they'd set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman is taken in adultery. The very act. 
Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what says that? You know, they already knew what the law said, so why did they bring him to the Lord? In verse 6, it says, and they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse them. That's why they brought her there. But Jesus stooped down with his finger, he wrote on the ground, and though they heard him, uh, as though he heard them not. And so when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. What did Jesus know? Jesus knew there was none sinless. And there again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Have no man condemned thee. She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. You notice he didn't say it was all right to stay in that state. He said, Go and sin no more. In other words, he's telling her to repent. And all his, all her accusers had left. They found themselves guilty. None was, could say that they had no sin or they had not sinned in their lives. And so as we look at the word blameless, doesn't mean that a man is sinless. The only one that ever lived a sinless life was Jesus Christ, the Son of God, being God's perfect lamb and perfect offering. But yet we can be blameless before the Lord. And so as we look at this term blameless, we find one account, 1 Timothy 3 and 2 there, when it's talking about the appointment of elders and the qualifications in the eldership. As he begins there in 3 and 2, there he says, he said, the bishop must be blameless, the husband of one wife, diligent, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy, a filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not a covetousness. One that rules well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For a man does not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novelist, lest by being lifted up with pride, he fall in condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have good report of them uh, which are without them, uh, and that uh, lest he fall in reproach and snare of the devil. And he goes on to, about the deacons. Also must the deacons be given, grave, not double-minded, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy look holding mystery of the faith and the pure conscience. And let these also be first be proved. Let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderous, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husband of one wife, ruling their children in their own houses well. And so it is the office of elders and deacons. They both are necessary that they be found blameless. Does that mean they've never sinned? No, that's not what it's teaching. But they're blameless in these qualifications as I look at it. They fulfill these qualifications that Paul is setting down. You know, if you got a man, his only problem is his temper. Can't control his tongue. Guess what? He cannot be pointed as an elder. And certainly you cannot say he's blameless because you can point that out. Or if someone has a problem, they like to go out drinking on the weekend party. Well, he cannot be pointed as an elder. Matter of fact, it would be questionable. He, he needs to repent as a Christian, period. Alone being appointed to eldership and certainly could not be blameless live in that type 
of life. And so as we continue all on some other points about blameless, what it may entail in, in the context, it may vary to how much broad, you know, it's like the English word blameless. How broad is it? <laughs> or how narrow can it be? It has to be consistent with the context in which it's written. And so to say that someone that's been blameless has not sinned, that's certainly not given in the context. But rather, they are blameless. God has seen that they're blameless in their life. Uh, you know, we, we find different occasions where those were to blame for certain things. For example, uh, Paul confronts Peter there in Galatians chapter, chapter 2 and verse 11. On this account, uh, but when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to blame. And then Paul goes on and, and explains why. For before the certain came from James, and he did eat with the Gentiles, but when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And so that. Peter always had a hang up of being afraid of the Jewish brethren. That's when he denied the Lord, when, when the Lord was uh, brought before Pilate, when he was on trial. And, and Peter said he would never deny him, but he denied him th three times. And so there it is. Peter found him in a certain situation. There he is sitting down with the Gentiles. He's eating with them. And to the Jews, you just don't do that. You just don't do that. And so he, uh, there we find that he did eat with the Gentiles, but when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision were those Jews. And he says other Jews dissembled likewise with him, and so much as Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. He says, but when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, Thou being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews. Why comparest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? Who do we, we who are Jews by nature, not sinners, and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man's not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ, we might be justified by faith of Christ and not by works of the law. And so Paul goes on and explains why he's, he's, you call it a correction, you call it a rebuke, but it's recorded for us. It's important. Important enough that's written down for our learning. What can we learn about this? No one's infallible. And certainly, there are some things that, because it's public, needs to be corrected publicly. And Peter being an apostle of Jesus Christ. You know, it, it, it took a lot, probably, it doesn't appear that Paul uh, was hesitant at all of correcting Peter. Because he was to blame. Because he needed correcting. He did it not only for those that was caught up in it, but he also done it for Peter as well. And he said, what do you mean did it for Peter? No one likes to be checked, called out. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what, if he was an elder at this time, we know that Peter was an elder at Jerusalem Church. And if he did not repent of this particular action, really, how could he hold the office of eldership? How could he be faithful as an apostle of Jesus Christ? Because it's inconsistent. It's a double standard. And so Paul had more than just one reason to call Peter out and let others know that what he did was wrong. It was not right. It was not right before the Jews because he was afraid of them. It was certainly not right to the Gentiles. Here you are, uh, we're preaching the, the gospel is for all, both Jew and Gentile. And here you are, you've got up and left them because circumcision come in and so when paul says 
you're to blame. He pointed it out. Peter, you need to correct this. He was setting a bad example and he needed to correct it. And Paul seen that it was not overlooked. Paul, you know, uh, uh, as we look at other times when he uses the term blameless, we look over in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 6. There, Philippians 3 and verse 6 of that chapter. There he's uh, also uh, referring, you know, he's always having trouble with the Jewish uh, brethren, those that don't believe, certainly those that believed he did not, but those that trusted in the things of the old law. And so as he addresses that in chapter three in the book of Philippians, as he goes on, uh, you know, uh, there in verse three, for we are the circumcision which worship God in spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus, having no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any man thinketh that he have whereof, he might trust in the flesh, I the more. There Paul goes on and says, circumcised the eighth day, stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. He says, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. That's touching the law of Pharisees. Look at his credentials under that old law. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. Wow. That's a lot to be said, isn't it? As concerning the law, he's talking about the Old Testament law. But as we know that on the road to Damascus, when the Lord cried out unto Saul, 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 why persecutest thou me? You know, he might have been keeping that under the old law, and he was blameless, but he certainly was not following Christ and God above, which he did in all good conscience. He thought everything he was doing was right. How many people do you know that? All times, they're, they're very zealous. They, they think what they're doing is right. And they find out later the scriptures teach something different. You know, it's hard to open someone's heart. They have to be willing to open it up themselves to the truth. You can drill it all day long. And if they don't think that they're not, you know, if they think they're in a saved state or a blameless state, you're not going to move. Them. It's only by knowing and understanding that I am guilty. I am a sinner and I need a savior. There are certain requirements that God expects. If the order to come in contact with the blood of Jesus Christ, that you may be blameless and remain in the state of being blameless before God. You know, on one other occasion in Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 5, in verse 7, it talks about the widows there. And those are taken in due to the time. I'll not go into that a lot, but you know, uh, it does point out the things that you give charge them that they may be blameless. And so there it is, that expression blameless is used again. And so those widows had to meet a certain criteria that you all, most of you would know and could probably name every one of them. You know, they had to be a certain age. They couldn't have nephews and children that could take care of them. Uh, they were responsible. You're not to charge the church. They had to be prayerful. They had to live a godly life. They had to be blameless. Which they had to, does that mean they never committed a sin? No. It meant that they had to meet these things that are revealed to us. They had to be blameless. And you just couldn't take them in. And you couldn't just do it because, well, I think it's a good thing that we do it. You know, a lot, a lot of times churches make decisions based on, well, I think it's a good idea. <laughs> Let's have that big sale. Now, can we have big sales? Yeah, we can have big sales for the right things, but certainly not for the Lord. Uh, 
And so, but any, and so this idea of supporting this widow as she had to be, she had to reach that certain age and the younger was to marry. And so now as we consider, the term blameless is used several times. As we look also into 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, we just finished up with that study. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and 12 and 13. And the Lord make you increase and abound in love one toward another, toward all men, even as we do toward you, to the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. And so each and every child of God is to present himself blameless. Uh, and that we're to be holy before God. And so as he touches also, Paul does in chapter 5 and 23. And that the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so as we are made blameless by God through Jesus Christ, by the blood of Christ. Some says, well, what's the difference between you? Well, I'm not a member of the church. Can I just uh, uh, bow down and accept Christ in my heart and that'd be sufficient? Can I then be blameless? No, you can't. You can't. You must remain as we will touch on that in a little bit, as the children of God, Christians are to maintain that life of godliness and to be blameless. Over in Philippians there, chapter 2, 12 through 15, Paul writes, Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in both you to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. That ye may be blameless and harmless as the sons of God. Tell you what, you've been murmuring? You've been complaining? Have you been disputing? What nature are you? As the children of God, would it be peacemakers? Can we at times discuss different things? Yes. But you know, if you can't discuss it calmly, you better off stay out of discussion. And because it's important. Because the all-seeing eye sees and knows. Knows our very hearts. Why? That we may walk in fear work out our own salvation without disputes, without murmuring. We live in society. I tell you, there's a lot of murmuring and complaining going on. Just go to your workplace sometimes. <laughs> Don't take very long. Sometimes you find out real quick. You're just better off to avoid it. You know, that old saying, and you got something good to say, keep your mouth shut. You know, something that may be a, a statement I heard when I was a young man. It's not a Bible quote, but it's good advice. Because guess what? There's plenty of them out there who wants to murmur and complain. And if you're doing that, how are you letting your light shine? Are you letting your light shine if you're that mind? We should be that. I mean, we have a human side of us, and sometimes we may find ourselves coming up short. And we got to repent. Each and every one of us, if we're complaining about somebody, uh, uh, gossiping, spreading news, I, I'll tell you what, we have all the electronics to spread any information you want, anything from good to bad to in between. What are we doing? With? Can we say that when we do those things that we're blameless? What are you doing every day? Are you blameless? 
Are you keeping your life in check? You know, we all have to keep our lives in check by the grace of God. And then it's something, if you're holding a grudge towards somebody, you better watch out because you're commanded to even love your enemies. You can't even hate them. I'll tell you, you have to work at that. You have to pray about that. Someone's insulted you or belittled you. I'll tell you what, you got to take a back seat and pray about it. You don't let the carnal man in you take over. Spirit of Christ may rule in your life. Because we are all still here in this body that wars against the soul. And we must keep and buffet it as Paul warns. The bishop must be blameless. And so not only him, but as Christians, we must maintain our lives that we let our light shine. How's your light shine? Does anyone got odd against you? You got odd against somebody that you need to correct. Before you bring your gift before the altar, you need, you got odd against your brother and sister. You're to work it out. God don't want them things to muster because I'll tell you what it does. It gives place for the devil. He says, don't you allow the sun come down upon your wrath because you give place for the devil. And so it is if you don't keep an honest and pure heart toward all the love all. You may find yourself being caught up and the devil is going to use you to his advantage. Don't let him take advantage of you. You know, as we think about those, when someone will says, well, I don't know what all I am guilty and not guilty of. I'll tell you what, there's a lot, a lot of things I was guilty of before I made the gospel I didn't know I was guilty of. <laughs> Until I become more knowledgeable of, of the scriptures. But as we learn and grow, we're to change our lives. You know, when Peter preached the first gospel sermon on the day of Pentecost, how do you think them Jews felt? There as he preached unto them. There in verse 36, he says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know surely that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. He Put the blame where the blame was to be put. You have crucified the Son of God. You know, when they cried out when Pilate, you know, when I grew up as a child, you know, they always heard about Pilate, but you didn't hear about the Jews that much. It was always pointing the finger at Pilate. You know, if we read here in Acts, who's he pointing at? Now, Pilate, even though he washed his hands, he said, you see to it, let it be upon you. When they cried out, let us be upon us and our children. Blame us and our children. We're taken. You go ahead, we let us do what we want to do. We're going to crucify the Christ. And yet, Pilate was not innocent. He had power to save the Lord. Of course, it was not God's will. This was God's plan that Jesus would be crucified. And so, when Peter points out to them on the day of Pentecost, you crucified the Lord. And it says there in verse 37, it says, when they heard this, they were pricked, were cut to the heart, and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter then said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for remissions of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Guess what? The very ones that crucified Christ were at this point washed in his blood, cleansed of their, their guilt, what they have done, and guess they're also blameless at that point. And not until they certainly was not blameless before, they were guilty of having Christ crucified, but upon their obedience to the gospel and coming in contact with the blood of Christ, they became blameless as the children of God, the sons of God. And so can we. So can you if you're not a member of the body of Jesus Christ. If you recognize that you've sinned, you're a sinner. 
you have not come in contact with the blood of Christ, you're still being held responsible. We're blamed for, all, for your sins that you've committed. You have earned death. That's your wages. Eternal separation from God. The God who's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. Offered up Christ that we may have redemption. That we may be blameless before him. Someone says, well, I, well, I know so-and-so down there and they've got this problem and they may have that problem. How can you say they're blameless? Well, there's times that we need to understand that we need to repent. We've not been what we need to be. And we can go to God in prayer if it's private in nature. You then can be come back in good standing with the Lord. If it's something public, need the prayers of the saints. God is faithful. Forgive us there in 1 John chapter nine, uh, chapter 1, verse 9. He says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just. Forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If, if we say that we've not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. And so as we understand to, to maintain, to be blameless, we must continue to be in the light. We must continue to confess our sins, knowing that God is faithful and just to forgive us, and that we may be in good standing with the Lord, found blameless on the day of judgment. Judgment day is closer. Every day that we live, whether we're old or young, we're one day closer today than we were yesterday. We're one day closer to the grave. Young and old. You don't know how many years you got left. I don't know how many years I have left. We've seen a lot of them die with COVID and other things. We never know. The Lord could come the very night. And how's your life? Are you put on Christ? If you're not, the invitation song, we're ready. We'll invite you as you come to sing the invitation.